The Interview of Jenny McDermott. I sent a request for an interview to one Jenny McDermott. I received a message on my answer machine from a number that instead of reading unknown caller, simply read error. The message included a location as well as terms for said interview. Alas, the conditions for such an interview were such that I was not allowed to record anything, and even the use of an implement of inscription was denied me. So, if there are any factual errors in the following, please forgive me, for my memory is not as it once was. Alas, I was forced to recount this tale completely from memory. In fact, I am certain that a number of the details are incorrect, so please take all that follows with a grain of salt. I was permitted a face-to-face -face meeting with Jenny. As I approached the building that my GPS directed me to, I was taken aback by its appearance. It wasn't just the way it sat upon an isolated hill in one of those desolate regions that polite society often chooses to abandon, nor the trees that refuse to sprout leaves even this late into the dog days of summer. What was wrong was something I didn't even realize, until long after the events I was transcribing occurred. It was the angles. The building seemed to loom over you. It was a large, squatting toad of a building, forever tense and prepared to leap away if disturbed. The foundation had all the stability of a lily pad. The structure seemed about to come crashing down upon you, should the crumbling foundation finally give way. The front door was ajar and easily pushed aside as I stepped into the decaying structure. It seemed quite out of place for the personality of the individual I was about to meet. You would think that it being just a few miles behind a Sherwin-Williams this combination Victorian slash log cabin slash Swiss chalet could have afforded a few coats of paint, even if for no other reason than to help hold the structure together. The voice of Jenny McDermott led me through the confusing hallways and interconnected rooms until I eventually found myself in her presence. She was sitting before an unlit fireplace. However, somehow, it seemed to radiate heat. The air was heavy and still. What little light was provided was supplied by what sunlight could penetrate the moth-eaten curtains that shielded the room. She had the exact same smile and wide eyes as I have seen in all her pictures. Her appearance was unmistakable. She silently gestured for me to sit across from her in a tall back chair that, even for someone of my size and stature, dwarfed me and made me feel small and insignificant. I thought I would start with an open-ended question and simply said, So, before we get into the meat of things, is there anything you would like to discuss? She launched into a tirade. She spoke with the speed and passion of a bipolar mental patient who had entered a manic phase. 
She focused on her desire to fix the lack of women in STEM fields and her plan for female empowerment in colleges. You see, it was her new job. She was now a college recruiter. She called herself a mission woman. She had a new plan to help women. She called it her pitch and switch program, and she described it as thus. She would approach a female, speaking to her in a fashion that would make it seem like it was the female's duty to take a degree in a STEM field. If the female resisted, Jenny would then talk about how women made only 75 cents of every dollar a man makes. Then Jenny would follow up with all sorts of pseudo-statistics designed to browbeat the female into signing up for a career in the hard sciences, one way or another. This was the pitch side of her program. I should point out that it was Jenny McDermott who kept using the words the female over and over when talking about potential students. She would always add some sort of strange pause before and after saying those words. Never woman, never student, just the female. And with the odd cadence and prosody. She continued. After we have the female signed up, we then immediately cut the program from our curriculum. This is the switch part. The female is much more likely to simply accept what happened with minimal amount of pushback. So we then help the female by offering to switch them to another college that I have a working relationship with. I get the recruitment bonus for signing the female up at the other college as well. And as far as I'm concerned, that's a win-win for everybody involved. I cannot imagine what my face must have looked like. The words utterly aghast spring to mind. The wind picked up and howled in the background. I cleared my throat several times and swallowed for my mouth had gone dry. I tried to think of a polite response to her. I eventually settled upon, but at least, after all that, the student will get a good education, right? Jenny began to giggle. At first it was a light, tittering laugh, but it quickly deepened. Soon other voices joined in, echoing out of her throat. The sound that filled the room was like a thousand damned souls chuckling, because if they ever dared to stop, the horror of their existence would overwhelm them, and the laughter would turn to wailing laminations. As the din began to crescendo, I fearfully sunk deeper into my chair, hoping to become lost in its voluminous dimensions. Jenny's eyes bulged, her face became flushed, yet her skin took on a bluish tint as if she could no longer take in oxygen. Still, she laughed, harder and harder, seemingly without need to pause for a single breath. When the blood began to freely flow from her nose, I was shaken from my reverie. I forced myself to stand, intent on trying to render aid. But that's when a new sound began. The laughing never paused, yet her body began to twist and contort into unusual and unnatural shapes. The sound of ligaments popping, tendons shredding, and bones cracking is a sound that cannot be properly described. I hope none of you ever have the misfortune of experiencing it yourselves. As I stood there, Completely dumbfounded as to what course of action to take, I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. I tore my gaze away from Jenny McDermott to scan the room. Small. Hairy. Humanoid. They came crawling out from under furniture. Stepping out of shadows. Their hair was black, their skin had the white of an albino cave fish. Their eyes were cloudy and filled with cataracts. Their clothes could only be described as constructed from wicker. 
from their clown-like shoes to their wide-brim hats, woven with unnatural skill. Yet the only sound they made as they crept forth was the soft splattering of water falling from their damp bodies onto the hardwood floor. Somehow that dripping sound cut through the cacophonic din of Jenny's laughter. They ignored me and instead approached Jenny like a pack of jackals being cautious of approaching a seemingly incapacitated prey. It was at this point that I noticed that every last one of them was lovingly fondling crude, rusty hammers that they cradled in their arms like sleeping children. They would speak softly to the hammers in a language I could not understand. Occasionally one would speak sing-song nonsense that you might say to a sleeping child. Yet another would coo. Out of the corner of my eye, I thought, I think I saw one kiss its hammer, in a fashion that used entirely too much tongue. One of them finally chose to act. It was swift and without mercy. The hammer was raised and brought down on Jenny's jaw. It took a moment for me to determine exactly what they were trying to do. They fell upon her, striking not at the head specifically, but aiming for her teeth. Her impossibly perfect teeth, far too many teeth, began to scatter across the gleaming, polished floors, like a handful of chiclets tossed across the surface of a frozen pond. Just as suddenly as they began, they started to scurry about, gathering up all the loose teeth. I hopped up into my chair so they could search under it, unimpeded by my feet. From there, I had a horrifying glimpse of Jenny. The top of her head had become completely detached and had landed in the dusty fireplace. Her eyes were doubting about, like a South American lizard, each eye observing events independent of the other. Her toothless mandible still clung to her neck by a strand of flesh. What was strangest of all was the gurgling sound her body made as her diaphragm continued to spasm in an attempt to keep laughing. I am certain it was less than a minute. The creatures had finished gathering up the teeth and began to retreat to the far corner of the room. One by one they slipped into shadow. It was at this point that I found my courage to act. I am not sure why, but I needed to know what it was that I was witnessing. And these creatures were the only ones who could answer my questions. Terror gripped my heart. Sanity told me to let this go. But I couldn't. I leaped from my perch, sending my chair tumbling behind me. The sound of a crashing to the floor caused the final creature to pause and look over its shoulder. This gave me the time I needed to close the gap between us. The look on its face was one of terror, and it leapt for whatever form of secretive egress they had access to. I managed to grab the hammer that it had slung over its back, but impossibly. The creature slid into the seam where the two walls of the room met at right angles as easily as you or I might slip behind a shower curtain. My hand followed it. I could watch the process. My hand, then my arm, became flat and two-dimensional. I could see the edge of my arm and it, a certain cocking of my head. My arm disappeared from view entirely, like a ribbon suspended between me and that space. I could have let go then, but I held on tight, and I was pulled through. I found myself holding a hammer and looking at a very surprised creature. If you ever played a video game where you no clip through a wall, wander about in the areas of the map you're not supposed to go, well, you will know how disjointed and strange everything looks from the other side. That's the best way I can describe it. Words fail me, 
in a place where parallel lines meet, it's hard to give exact descriptions. On the other side, only the creatures looked solid. Only the creatures looked real. The others were further ahead and in a line. The one in front of me turned to flee after them. I knew that at this point I was committed to my course of action, and with no other choice I pursued them through this nightmarish realm of shells and impossible angles. My mind was not prepared to exist in a world where the very laws of physics had betrayed me, but I focused on the entity before me and found the will to stumble through this non-Euclidean world. The very ground seemed like I was running across shifting piles of compact disks, and the world was made of sheets of completed cardboard puzzles that would break apart under the force of a single breath. Eventually, that which I pursued dropped down out of sight, and I followed it over the precipice without hesitation. When I landed, reality had, for the moment, resolved itself back into some semblance of normality. It was a moist, subterranean vault. The floor was a dark, rich loam. The vaulted ceilings were cyclopean in scale. The area was peppered with stalagmites and stalactites, odd outcroppings of rock. It gave me the impression I was inside a giant gaping maw, a mouth paused just before biting down. For some reason, the air itself seemed to have a luminous quality that came from no discernible source. The creatures were all here, and the creatures moved with purpose. They gathered in the center of the room and began to dig. They dug holes in the black loam of the cavern floor. When they were but a foot deep, they then planted the teeth that they had recently harvested. Each creature squatted over its hole, strained as if defecating, then filled in the hole with its hind legs before scurrying away to cower behind stone or wedge themselves deep inside narrow crevasses. Eyes in the dark glittered in anticipation. I wretched. The events up to this point were simply too much, and I could not help but vomit. The method of my arrival, as well as the stench of this place, was simply overwhelming, and I was incapacitated by my heaving stomach and twisting bowels. A deep green fluid, bitter and biting, rushed out of my mouth as I heaved forth all the bile my body could produce. Just as I had finally felt I had reached the limits of what I could expel due to gastrointestinal distress, I saw the ground shift where the teeth had been buried. A lingering line of spit trailed from my mouth to the ground. I lifted my gaze from it on hands and knees to bear witness to the rebirth of Jenny McDermott. A hand thrust up from the ground as ah, Jenny McDermott pulled itself free. I say, ah, Jenny McDermott, because she was immediately followed by a second. The first to have broken free of the earthen womb had the advantage over the second. The old fell upon the new, biting at the back of its neck, breaking it beneath powerful jaws. If the Jenny McDermott's came out of the ground one at a time, the first one would have most likely prevailed. However, soon a surge emerged in mass, and they all fell upon one another. The first one disappeared. I couldn't tell which one was the original, which one were the new, not that it mattered much. Inhuman sounds echoed through the chamber as they fought to end one another. I turned my gaze to the creatures that I had followed to find this place. To the last, they were hidden in shadow. Their expressions, what few I could see, were a mixture of fear and pride, of duty and resolution. 
the one nearest to me returned my gaze. It briefly parted its lips, as if to speak to me. Late at night, when I lie in my bed staring at the ceiling, I often wonder, what was it about to say? A kind word? A threat? A warning? I would never know. Something caught its attention out of the corner of its eye. It shrunk down and disappeared from view. That was the point when I noticed the cavern was completely silent. I turned back to the center of the room, only to have my view blocked by the face of Jenny McDermott, nose to nose with mine. She had that same smile, those wide eyes that I had seen when I first met her. Given I was on my hands and knees, my neck tilted back to look up. Her neck must have been at a most unnatural angle to be looking at me in the fashion that she was. Then she spoke in a soft voice that seemed both normal and conversational in tone. Sorry about that, she said. Shall we get back to the interview? It was at that point, mercifully, darkness took me. Sometime later, in a Kansas wheat field, I awoke to the sensation of a starving crow tearing off my left earlobe and flying away with it. Suddenly, I stood up, disoriented, and I got to watch my flesh devoured as the crow sat upon the top of a nearby telephone pole. The avian pecked at its little treat repeatedly, apparently savoring its meal, or perhaps mocking me by drawing out the experience. I had nothing on me save the clothes on my back. My knees were stained dark from kneeling a material of unspeakable foulness. By the time I had returned to civilization, I had discovered that all my credit cards had been maxed out. When I related my story to the authorities, I had been missing for three days. I was also informed that there was no structure at the location that I gave them. In fact, Google Maps could not even find the name of the street that I claimed I had found the home on. I was then tested for various drugs, had my ear patched up, was filled with antibiotics that were applied with a hose and then called some friends to wire me some money. Upon entering my apartment, I noticed there was a message on my answering machine. The caller ID simply read, Error. I, without hesitation, hit the erase button.